People are always asking me questions like, how'd you shoot that shot? Or, Why did I choose one shot from another? It's hard for me to answer questions like that because a lot of the things I do when I'm playing pool are instinctive. So in this presentation, Jim and I will break the techniques down and explain them to you so you can learn the theory and application of advanced play. Jim Rimpey is known on the professional circuit as King James. He's 11 times world champion, plays all variations of the game, and holds 64 major titles. Lori John Jones is the first lady of pool. She's currently ranked number one in the world and, like Jim Rimpey, has been playing the game all her life. By now, you should be breaking the balls pretty well, cutting balls, making bank shots, and drawing and following your cue ball more consistently. If your fundamentals are sound, you should be able to do all of that. But if not, don't confuse yourself with these advanced techniques. Go back to the basics and make sure you have them well in hand first. Okay, first thing we want to do is check your stroke. You want to set up a shot using a striped ball as your cue ball. You want to pocket the object ball with a stop shot. In our first presentation, Pool School, we showed you how to make a stop shot. To hit the cue ball with just enough draw on it to make contact with the object ball just as the draw decays into skid, so the cue ball will stop dead on the spot. You should be able to pocket the object ball and leave little or no movement on the cue ball. And you should be able to do this consistently. If you can, then your stroke is sound. You're setting up properly. You're using your 90 degree elbow. And most important, you're controlling your tip position. A lot of players use speed to control the cue ball. That's fine as far as it goes. Speed is important. But a more consistent way to control your cue ball is by using speed and tip position. We usually refer to this as percentage of tip. The mathematical possibilities of tip position on the cue ball are virtually infinite. It's the combination of these percentages of high, low, left and right spin that cause the cue ball to perform as you want it to. Using the same medium speed stroke and low spin, Jim will show you how percentage of tip is applied and why. First, a half tip low. We'll mark the table to show how the cue ball responds. This small amount of back spin or draw keeps the cue ball in position for shots at this end of the table. Now the same stroke with a full tip of low. Notice that the draw action of the cue ball is increased, moving the cue ball farther across the table, positioning it for shots near the middle of the table. Now extreme low spin is applied. This produces maximum draw on the cue ball and positions the cue ball for shots at the other end of the table. The object ball was pocketed with each shot and the speed of the stroke didn't change, but percentage of tip provided control over the cue ball. With varying percentages of tip and combinations of high, low, left and right spin, you can set the cue ball up for almost any shot on the table. Here's an exercise for all the type pool games. I call it a brainwash course. It'll help you to learn to control the cue ball, you know, to put it where you want to on the table. It requires proper ball selection, and it's going to make you see patterns. Spread all 15 balls around the table. None of them should be touching the cushion. The object is to start wherever you like on the table and pocket all the balls without letting the cue ball touch the cushion at any time. If it does, start over. Now let's follow along with Jim. He'll always be thinking four or five shots ahead. The six is a straight in shot with a little low English to set him up for the nine. He pockets the nine with some low English to shoot the two ball in the same pocket. The two is a straight in shot, but he'll use maximum low and left spin, which allows him to hit the object ball fuller, but decreases his chances of hitting the rail. The three is pocketed with a little draw or underspin on the cue ball to come back into position for the 15 ball in the side pocket.
an easy high English follow on the 15 leaves him an easy shot at the 7 in the corner, and so it goes. The importance of an exercise like this is to teach you to leave yourself the easiest shot possible and always plan ahead several shots. You've got to practice this for two to three hours every day for at least a couple of weeks without playing any pool games. That's why I call it a brainwashing course, especially for games like eight ball and straight pool. And I guarantee you that after those couple weeks, those patterns will just jump right out at you, and you'll know you're playing proper position. And here's something else I want you to practice. It's called a kill shot. It's going to come up a lot more than you think it will, and you need to know how to use it. The best way to hit a kill shot is with a combination of spin and draw. The draw component of the shot slows the forward motion of the cue ball as it travels across the table. And the spin component of the shot helps diminish cue ball movement or stop the cue ball when it contacts the rail. It is the reverse of running English. Instead of helping the ball travel around the table, it minimizes or prevents the ball from traveling. In some cases, it even helps pocket the object ball. There are several variations of the kill shot. First, using a low left spin allows Jim to kill the ball in the corner by using two rails. In this case, spin applied opposite the angle of the bank helps slow the cue ball movement and gives more control over where the cue ball will stop. Next, Jim will kill the ball very quickly off one rail using an easy stroke and low right spin. And this third shot is a cut and kill. The shot is made with a little right spin. The object ball is struck more fully and thrown to the pocket, but thanks to the fuller hit, the cue ball takes only a slight angle to the right and kills on the rail. You can see how mastering the kill shot can add a great deal to your ability to play position from anywhere on the table. If you're gonna learn to play top level pool, you have to learn to follow a ball properly with English and with force. We call that a force follow. There are three ways to follow a ball. First, with English or high tip follow. This is a smooth shot with maximum high tip. Another is with just a little more speed and a half tip of spin applied just above center. It's a slightly sharper stroke. And the third way, which is the true force follow, is actually a stun shot. The ball is struck firmly and sharply at center. Force follow is more inertia than spin. The sheer weight and speed of the ball, its inertia, makes it follow. And any deviation from a straight-on shot will cause the cue ball to jump to the side before following. Practice this exercise to learn how to create an angle on the cue ball when the shot permits you nothing more than a very slight angle to work with. It's important that you understand the subtle differences between high English follow and force follow. Here is the high English follow. Now the force follow. The shots are similar, but the resulting cue ball action is totally different. Now we're going to talk about your sight picture and some aiming techniques and their relationship to cue ball deflection. Notice the cue stick's angle just before impact. Now look at the intended path the cue ball should travel. Now note the actual path the cue ball will take to make proper contact to pocket the object ball. The difference between the intended path and the actual path is the angle of deflection. Now watch the cue ball take the deflected path. Choose a pool cue with minimal deflection and you will have minimized one more variable in your game. The better cues made today deflect far less than the old style cues which were either single piece designs or had steel joints and hard ivory ferrules which wouldn't flex. Newer methodology, using cues with negligible tip deflection, offers an opportunity to take advantage of an aiming technique called parallel aiming. When you're aiming down the line, you should be using your dominant eye over the cue to get a good sight picture. But the way you aim for a center ball shot is not the way you aim for a shot using spin. With parallel aiming, you always get a center ball sight picture. Here's how it's done. You sight along a line which is over or through the center of the cue ball, but parallel to the cue. And that allows you to aim accurately for shots with spin.
It seems simple, and it is. But many players today would have less trouble with their shots if they had known this and trained themselves with the parallel method of aiming. So use a good pool cue, one with little or no deflection, and teach yourself to use parallel aiming, and you'll play a better game. If you're having trouble with your combination shots, maybe you don't understand how complicated a combination shot really is. So we're going to show you. If the ball you want to drop is three feet from the pocket, and the combination or struck ball is two feet from it, and it's four feet further down the table to the cue ball, it's mathematically like aiming at a four-inch target from a mile away using a handheld rifle with no sight and aiming down the barrel. Yet, good players are able to make shots like this quite frequently. Let's illustrate. Here's our shot. We know that to pocket this ball, we have to hit it exactly here with this ball. So take the time to prepare yourself for the shot. Take a deep breath. Relax. Then get down into your stance and begin purifying your tip and begin aiming, starting with the first ball in the combination. Your mental computer will begin to make adjustments. Too much. Too much the other way. A little more. Your breathing slows as you get closer and closer to the shot, and you continue to make tiny adjustments. And when your mind says it's right, you pull the trigger. Letting your perceptions, visual, mental, and muscular, control the shot greatly improves your odds of making such a difficult shot. And the more you train your mind to handle these shots, the more fine-tuned it becomes, and the better it gets at delivering the information you need to make your shots, whether they're simple or difficult. It is this ability to focus concentration that separates the players from the pretenders. You have to practice. You don't really learn combinations. You feel or perceive them. And the more you practice these shots, the more information your mental computer has, the better you'll be at combinations as well as your other shots. Now look, if you get confused about any of this, we want you to rewind the tape and review it as much as you need to. This stuff isn't easy, so just be patient and work at it. Now you know about single bank shots and the way the rail affects the ball, but you've learned to compensate for that with a little bit of running English. Now we're going to get into some really advanced bank shots. We know that energy is transferred from ball to ball by something we can call a gear effect. In other words, any spin applied to the cue ball will be reversed on the struck ball. So now we're going to show you how to use that knowledge to make the cue ball and the object balls perform the way you want them to. First, let's talk about pinching. When we say pinching, we're talking about holding up or retarding the ball's path of travel. Here's the shot. You can see that the angle to the intended pocket is greater than we can accomplish with just speed. Or maybe the ball is too close to the rail to cross bank it without double kissing the cue ball. So these are the times when you'll have to pinch the ball. Pinching requires you to apply spin to the same side as your intended pocket. If we're going to pocket the ball to the right, we'll add right spin to the cue ball, plus low tip to avoid a kiss after the rebound, and even choke up on the bridge just a little. We'll aim a little bit long, remembering that the rail will take something away from our perceived angle, and make it a firm stroke to help straighten out the angle. It's not difficult to learn, and it's very useful. Now we're going to discuss cross banking, that is, crossing the path of the object ball with the cue ball. You can cross bank when you can't pinch, provided there's no danger of a double kiss. Just remember the rail effect and add some spin to compensate. We'll start our discussion of multiple banks with a two rail bank shot, like this. The angle off the first bank is nearly normal. The second bank shortens the angle so your aim is to almost make the ball on the first bank. The spin reverses off the second rail, shortens the angle, and pockets the ball. Speed is a factor in all bank shots, and it's something you'll have to practice to learn. 
Just remember that more speed means more compression of the rail rubber, more transfer of spin. So the angle is more restrained. Sometimes you may find it necessary to use a three rail bank shot. You'll add some English in the opposite direction of travel in order to put running English on the object ball. The angle off the first rail is nearly normal. The second rail sustains the running English and opens the angle slightly and the ball pockets off the third rail. The running English you've applied to the object ball by adding opposite English to the cue ball helps the object ball get around since each cushion tends to add to the running English effect. Three and four bank shots are great for use in one pocket or banks and you'll find applications in nine ball too. But be sure you remember to add running English to the object ball by applying English to the cue ball in the opposite direction. Here's a four rail shot. Make note of the fact that while the diamond pattern can be helpful, it is not an absolute and should not be relied on. The table may be playing long or short. So use the diamonds only for general reference. Now here's a combination of techniques you'll find helpful. It's called a cross bank with a pinch. Watch. Let's see it again, this time from overhead. To pinch the ball, that is to retard its path of travel, we add a little English to the same side as the pocket and bank the object ball. You'll see that the spin we've put on the object ball works with the rail effect to cut the angle way back. The second rail reverses the spin and we get an almost natural angle from the third rail. The effect is to bank backwards to the pocket. It's a cross angle bank with a pinch. When the cue ball contacts one or more cushions before it hits the object ball, it's called kicking, but it's not a speed or a strength shot. In fact, kicking is actually a shot that calls for finesse. First, a soft kick. We'll use a little overspin or high English on the cue ball, hitting it as near center as we can so there is no unwanted left or right spin, as demonstrated by this striped ball. It's not a speed shot. Less speed means less rail effect, and we want it as near the natural angle as possible. The cue ball is aimed slightly beyond the natural angle to compensate for the rail effect the ball will feel, and then your natural perceptions should solve the problem. Here is a firm kick. It requires a little more speed and a slightly lower tip to avoid hopping the rail. And when making a firm kick, you must apply some spin in the direction of the kick to overcome the loss at the rail. Here's another situation you'll run into frequently. The object ball is frozen to the rail. The only way the shot can be made is to drive the object ball into the rail, get the cue ball out of the way, and let the compression of the rail throw the ball toward the pocket. Here's how that's accomplished. To avoid the double kiss, the cue ball has to strike the object ball at an angle, so we aim to overcut the angle. The harder the object ball is driven into the cushion, the more restraining effect the cushion will have on the path of the object ball, and the more English is transferred from the cue ball to the object ball, since the compressed rail offers a wall of restraint. In this particular shot, we'll use a firm medium speed stroke with about a quarter or half tip low English to keep the cue ball from climbing the rail, also to avoid creating any unwanted spin. The angle to the pocket is about 15 or 20 degrees. We'll aim to cut the object ball just about in half. At contact, the surfaces of the ball exchange energy and the cue ball drives the object ball into the rail. The cue ball escapes at an angle and the object ball is thrown out of the cushion. The angle is foreshortened and the ball travels to the pocket. Now here's another example of a ball frozen to the rail. In this situation, we need to aim fully at the object ball because the bank is already almost on or correct. Now this may very well be the most difficult of all frozen ball shots. 
Again, we'll use just a quarter or half tip low English. But this shot is made as firmly as you can make it and still maintain control of the cue ball. You must compress the rail enough to allow the object ball to pass the cue without a kiss. As the object ball drives into the cushion, the escape angle is actually created by the extreme compression of the rail rubber. And now here's something many experienced players don't know. This little ridge in the side pocket is the pocket liner. It helps save wear and tear on the pocket. But when the object ball is frozen to the rail within a half or three quarters of an inch of the pocket, we can use the pocket liner to help us bank the ball across to the other side pocket. The liner tends to stiffen the rubber a little so it doesn't compress quite as much as the rest of the rail. The result of driving into the rail at this point is that the rubber restrains the angle tremendously and allows us to pocket the ball in the opposite pocket. The shot is made with just a little low tip to avoid climbing the rail and the cue ball is aimed to cut the object ball almost in half. Remember that this is only possible within a half to three quarters of an inch from the side pocket points. Now we're going to get into carom shots. These are fun because now you can get to show off a little once you learn to see and use carom angles. You can use these for trick and fancy shots too. The word carom simply means a glancing blow. And that can be anything from a shot that barely grazes the object ball to one that hits the object ball almost straight on. Here's an example. The weight of these balls at rest, their inertia, which supports the object ball, is greater than the inertia of the cue ball in motion. So if we draw a line through the dead center of both the object ball and the ball touching it, and hit it anywhere within this arc, we get a true carom angle. That means the object ball must travel 90 degrees to the line through the two balls. Try it for yourself. If the object ball is supported by two or more balls and is struck from anywhere within this arc, the true carom angle will send it 90 degrees to a line drawn through the center of the object ball and the ball next to it. If the object ball is not fully supported, but is only kissing one ball, then we can change the carom angle by cutting thinner or fuller on the object ball, or by the addition of spin, or with a combination of these elements. Here is what would be the true carom angle if the object ball were fully supported. Here's the path of the cue ball, and here is the resultant angle of this unsupported carom which we can change to suit our needs. We can change that angle by dividing the cue ball's force between the struck ball and the kissing ball. In this case, the cut is full, so the struck ball feels most of the force from the cue ball. The kissing ball is driven out of the way, and the inertia of the struck ball carries it to the pocket. Let's look at another. In this case, the struck ball was hit with a thin cut, so the struck ball felt very little of the cue ball's force. The carom angle is changed only slightly, and the struck ball imparts very little force to the kissing ball. The result is almost a perfect carom angle on the struck ball. When you understand that you can increase or decrease the inertia of the cue ball by varying your speed and spin, and by cutting the struck ball thin or full, you have an infinitely variable carom shot to work with. Now, here are three examples of how you can use carom angles to billiard off one ball and pocket another. To billiard simply means to bounce off one ball before striking another. Lori John will hit the cue ball with a center ball stroke, adding just a little left spin. Since the cue ball will follow slightly at impact, she's going to aim slightly fuller on the one ball. The cue ball billiards off the one and follows a natural angle to pocket the nine. Here's another billiard shot. Jim is going to use the two ball as an unsupported carom for the one ball. He'll make the stroke with a little low spin and aim to drive the one ball into the two fairly fully. Now in this example, Jim's going to billiard the cue ball off the two, then make it travel down the rail to pocket the nine ball. The stroke is made with pure high English. The cue ball hits the two ball head on, and the spin takes over after the cue ball's forward motion is stopped. 
The slight angle off the two plus the rail effect provide the direction needed to move the cue ball along the rail to pocket the nine. Position play is how the professionals win tournaments. First we're going to talk about playing for position, and then we're going to put you to work on an exercise that will help you master the technique. In advanced play, simply pocketing the ball is not enough. You must always be planning ahead two, three, five, even six shots ahead. And leave your cue ball in an advantageous position for each and every shot. The secret is to avoid difficult or tricky shots by planning ahead, playing for position. First, let's discuss natural cue ball angle. In this example, there's only one cutting angle you can use that will pocket the object ball with a no English center ball stroke. That means the cue ball follows a natural angle after contact. But you'll probably need position for your next shot, so add some English. In this example, we've added a little high. With varying combinations of low, high, left, and right, we can leave the cue ball in almost any position on the table. Here's an exercise. Set up some shots and practice changing the cue ball's natural angle by adding spin. You should be able to pocket the object ball and get different cue ball positions by adding variations of English. First, a center ball hit with virtually no English, showing the natural cue ball path. Here's a high English shot. Watch the cue ball. Now, a low English shot. Watch the cue ball. Here's a shot with some left English. And one with right English. If you will practice changing the cue ball angle by applying English, you'll learn to play good position pool and win. Now, here's another aspect of position play you need to work on. This shot can be made like so, pocketing the ball and leaving the cue ball generally where it's needed for the next shot. But coming across the angle like this means that your speed must be exact. There's almost no margin for error, and speed is the most variable factor in your stroke. Another way to make the shot is like this, approaching the angle when you have no other options. Remember that by using the rail, you're gaining speed control of the cue ball, so your margin for error is greater. But by far, the best way to handle this shot is like so, coming into the angle and using all the rail you can to control the speed of the cue ball. This is so important to successfully playing the game that we want to go over it again. Remember, coming across the angle requires exact speed control, and speed is the hardest factor to control. A better option is to approach the angle using the rail to help control your speed. But by far, the best way is to come into the angle and use all the rails possible, giving far better speed and position control. And this is what you should practice. Seeing the angle, using the rails, and coming into the angle. Now that you have a good basic stroke, I'm going to show you something new, how to use your wrist during your stroke, something we call tuck and throw. For a right-handed player, bringing the wrist toward the hip during the stroke causes the tip to wipe across the cue ball from center toward the right, adding English velocity. That's called tuck. If the wrist moves away from the hip during the stroke, the Q-tip wipes across the cue ball from about the center toward the left side, adding English velocity. That's throw. Just the opposite is true for a left-handed player, of course. Both tuck and throw can be used to maintain tip contact with the cue ball for just a bit longer. That allows you even greater English velocity since it adds spin as the tip wipes across the ball. Let's look again at a tuck shot to help clarify that. As the stroke is made, the wrist moves sharply in toward the hip. The Q-tip, as a result, moves across the surface of the cue ball from center toward the right, staying on the ball longer and imparting more English velocity. Let's watch Jim make a shot with throw. The wrist moves out, away from the hip, wiping the tip across the cue ball from about center to the left. 
it stays on the ball longer and thus imparts even more English velocity to the cue ball. Jim has used throw to give the cue ball the greatest possible English velocity and kill off the second rail. The regulation table is four and a half by nine feet across the playing surface, right? Well, yes and no. Yes, it is, but if you're an advanced player, the table is actually bigger than that. We call this the expanded table, and here's how you can use it. If the rail rubber is in good condition, it compresses when struck by a ball. In fact, you can drive a ball as much as three quarters of an inch into a rail. That means the table's playing area is actually an inch and a half longer and wider than its static dimension. Here's an example. The cue ball is frozen to the rail, and the object ball is frozen to the cue ball. To turn this negative situation around and convert it into a makeable shot, you have to use the expanded table. The cue ball is driven into the rail so that its rebound angle allows it to kick the object ball to the pocket. Watch closely. Here's another example of using the expanded table. In order to pocket the object ball, in this case the three, it's necessary to drive the struck ball into the rail, overcorrect the angle, and make the struck ball drive the object ball to the pocket. Another example of expanded table use is this. Here we don't want to hit the blocking ball. The cue ball is driven into the rail with extreme reverse spin in order to escape the blocking ball, follow a curved path down the table, and pocket the object ball. That's called a curved escape shot, and it's possible only by using expanded table technique. Let's take it one element at a time. The cue ball is driven into the cushion with extreme reverse spin. The rail throws the ball out, and the spin on the cue ball causes it to take a curved path to the object ball. Here's one more example of using the expanded table. Let's say that both your object ball and the cue ball are hanging in the corner pockets. In this instance, we'll use the point of the pocket as a banking surface. The point must be struck at exactly the right spot for this to work, but it's another aspect of the expanded table, and with practice, it can be used when no other options exist. There are even times when you will ride the rail in order to pocket a ball and get the cue ball into position for your next shot. This is called creating an angle off the rail with elevation. Here we have a straight in shot. We can follow the object ball and scratch or draw the cue ball back and still not be up the table for our next shot. In this case, the solution is to create an angle by elevating the cue and striking the ball above center with some left spin. The cue ball contacts the object ball, then jumps up onto the rail. As it rolls off the rail and contacts the second cushion, the left spin component of the shot carries the cue ball down the table for position. We'll look at it again. Remember, this is a speed control shot too much and the cue ball is simply off the table. Now this technique will become more clear when we address jump ball shots later in this program. Here's another technique you can use to gain position. Both the cue ball and the object ball are frozen to the rail. The technique is to drive the cue ball into the cushion, letting it cut the object ball as it comes out. But you can control your cue ball position by using some low English. The cue stick angle in relation to the rail is pronounced. With a center ball stroke, the cue stick angle to the cushion is decreased, so there's less resistance from the cushion. That means the rebound angle will be different. And with high English, there's very little resistance from the cushion, so be sure you adjust the angle of the cue stick in relation to the cushion for each variation. Now, here's a phrase you'll hear a lot, cheating the pocket. It simply means pocketing a ball to one side or the other rather than straight into the center of the pocket. And it can be used to gain position for your next shot. Here are four variations on cheating the pocket for this straight in close angle shot. First, 
following with some high left English. The object ball goes into the pocket on the left side while the cue ball goes off left. Now with high right English, the object ball still cheats the pocket left, but the cue ball goes to the right. With low left English, the object ball cheats the pocket and the cue ball draws back to the rail and the angle opens to the left. Low right English will cheat the pocket and allow the cue ball to draw back to the rail, but the return angle is foreshortened and it kills when it strikes the rail. You know, not all of the game is played on the surface of the table. Today, a lot of the game is played up here, above the table. And if you don't believe that, just watch this. Playing a jump ball is becoming a more accepted way to handle a shot when you're in difficult positions. And although it takes a lot of practice and an absolute mastery of tip position, it's a valuable aspect of advanced play. Here is the rationale behind a jump ball. Since we're dealing with round objects, spheres, they can pass very close to one another without touching when they're in the air. And that lets you do things in the air you can't do on the table. First, let's make it clear that you do not make a jump ball shot by scooping the cue ball off the table. That is a miscue over the ball and is a foul. In order for it to be a legal stroke, the tip must contact the cue ball at least one and one eighth inch above the table above the ball's center. The dynamics of the stroke cause the ball to jump up and over. Let's analyze the setup for a jump ball shot. Since we want to strike down on the cue ball, placing it between the immovable table and the irresistible force of the cue, we must elevate the stroke. So the elevated bridge is used and the cue is gripped with the forearm parallel to the table surface. It may be that you will be up on one toe in order to gain more elevation. It probably will be necessary to crowd the cue ball a little in order to gain elevation, so the bridge arm is slightly bent. But notice that the 90 degree elbow is still maintained for maximum force at impact. Now here are the two keys to success with this stroke. First, be sure to draw the cue all the way back to the bridge hand for the stroke. Don't short stroke it. You'll have no power. And second, be sure to follow through to make the sharp, shocking stroke you need. At the moment of impact, the wrist is snapped upward, causing the tip to dive and maintain contact with the cue ball for a longer time, which imparts the most spin possible to the ball. Remember, in order for a jump shot to be a legal stroke, the ball must be struck above center. It is the dynamics of the shot that causes the cue ball to jump off the table, not a scooping action by the tip. And also remember that when using a standard cue to jump a full ball's height, you'll have to have somewhere between 14 and 20 inches of travel before the cue ball will clear. Let's review the elements of making a jump shot. First, use an elevated bridge and stroke arm. To be sure you have a free, easy stroke and enough elevation, most people will have to hold the forearm parallel to the surface of the table. Maintain the 90 degree elbow for power at impact and maximize the spin applied by snapping the wrist at impact to keep the cue ball on the ball longer. Be sure to draw the cue all the way back for a full stroke and don't forget, you'll want to follow through. Remember that the aiming plane is elevated and the tip must contact the cue ball above true center in order to make the stroke legal. Naturally, all these techniques and others that you will develop for yourself are high risk shots, but they do have a place in your competitive arsenal and there are times when you will have no other choice but to use them, so they are certainly worth practicing. If you master these techniques I'm about to show you, You'll probably never have to pay for your own table time again. These are called Mass A shots. They're flashy, they're fun to watch, perfectly legal, and you can use them to win games. A Mass A shot requires you to apply extreme English to the cue ball. This is done by elevating the butt of the cue about 40 to 90 degrees to the bed of the table and striking down on the cue ball. 
The result, of course, is that it is almost pure English that dictates the travel of the cue ball, and it causes the cue ball to take a curved path. Now, that path may be a long curved path, a short, extremely curved path, or anything in between. In fact, the word masse means curve. Let's examine the setup for a masse. For most masse shots, you'll actually sit on the table, but remember, one foot must always be in contact with the floor. A closed bridge is used, and since the bridge hand isn't resting on the table, it's held with the wrist firmly against or on the hip for stability. The grip is turned up so that the 90 degree elbow can be maintained for the most power at impact. A masse shot is a variable combination of three elements, direction, forward motion, and English. Direction is dictated by the aim of the cue. Forward motion is controlled by the amount of elevation you give the cue. And you understand English. We're merely applying that spin in an elevated plane, looking down on the cue ball rather than straight on. A long masse, such as this one, requires more forward motion than English. An escape masse probably requires a balance of the two. And a very short masse, sometimes called a squirt shot, requires almost no forward motion but a great deal of English. Now let's go over that again. There are three elements to a masse shot. Direction, forward motion controlled by the elevation of the cue, and English. Some practice will prove to you that these three elements must be balanced in order to accomplish a masse shot, but the rewards are very satisfying. Now let's analyze the shot Lori John is about to make. The object here is to pocket the object ball from a position where that would ordinarily be impossible. She's aiming to allow for the curve the cue ball will take on the way to the object ball. That is direction. She will need quite a bit of forward travel, so the pool cue isn't elevated very much. This is a long masse, or curve shot, made with low right English applied in an elevated plane. Now, for contrast, let's watch Jim make a very short masse, or squirt shot. Since he needs almost no forward motion, the cue is almost straight up and down. His aiming point is largely a matter of experience, since the extreme spin will be the major factor in the cue ball's path of travel. And now let's see a medium masse that allows the cue ball to escape around some blocking balls in order to pocket the object ball. Remember the three elements, direction, which is where the shot is aimed, forward motion dictated by cue elevation, in this case roughly 70 degrees, and spin applied in an elevated plane. Here, it's extreme right, with just a touch of low. Here is one of the most spectacular of all Massey shots. It looks simple, but Jim has to have perfect aim to pocket the object ball, and he has to put exactly the right English on the cue ball to make it change directions in order to gain position for another shot. Now watch again as the cue ball actually changes direction after pocketing the object ball. At impact, the forward motion is stopped and the cue ball squirts to the left a little. Then the tremendous English he's put on the ball takes over and carries the cue ball to his right for position. This is called a warp shot because the cue ball's path of travel is changed, warped, and it represents very advanced technique. One word about practicing masse shots, they can be hard on equipment, so practice on your own table or ask your club manager which table you can use to learn the technique. You know, in all sports, even one-on-one -on -one sports like golf, tennis, bowling, most players have their own coaches. The reason for that is because once they start to develop a bad habit, the coach usually helps them out. So take my word for it. If it's at all possible, find yourself a coach. It'll help your game. If you've mastered the basics that we've showed you in our first tape, and you're willing to put some effort into learning these advanced techniques, you're really going to be a good player. Good? Heck, you'd be a better player than 90% of the people you'd be playing against. And that, you can bank on.
Quickly, let's review the things Jim and Lori John have been demonstrating for advanced play. Tip position is by far the most consistent way to get superior cue ball control. And cue ball control is the professional's secret to success. So teach yourself to control the cue ball with percentage of tip and not just speed. Use Jim's brainwashing exercise to develop an eye for patterns and proper ball selection. Practice kill shots to leave the cue ball exactly where you want it for your next shot. Master the force follow, which is actually a stun shot, and high English follow. With either, you can create an angle on the cue ball when you need one. Remember that parallel aiming is the only technique that offers you a center ball sight picture for each of your shots. And remember that the mental game is an important aspect of advanced play, especially in combinations, caroms, and banks, which are not absolutes. So be sure you practice good techniques in order to program your mental computer to solve and execute your shots correctly. Pinching is a technique that retards the ball's path of travel, and as a useful technique to learn, you pinch a ball by applying spin to the same side as your intended pocket. When making bank shots, remember the more speed you use, the more the rail will close or shorten the angle of the bank. When cross banking, remember to add spin opposite to the direction of the pocket to compensate for the rail effect. Use the diamond patterns only for general reference. They cannot compensate for the way a table plays under different atmospheric conditions. Remember that kicking is a shot that calls for finesse, not speed or strength. Be sure to apply a little spin in the direction of the kick to compensate for the rail loss. Practice expanded table techniques, driving the rail, using the points and flats of the pockets, or even to create an angle off the rail when you have no other options. An object ball which is fully supported will always give you a true carom angle. While an unsupported ball offers you an opti own carom angle by balancing the elements of spin, speed, and cut. Whenever possible, use the rails to control your speed and come into the angle for better position. Practice tuck and throw to keep the tip on the cue ball a bit longer and give you even greater English velocity. Jumping balls requires practice, but is an increasingly accepted and crowd-pleasing way out of seemingly impossible situations. Just remember that the dynamics of the shot, the application of spin in an elevated plane, makes the ball jump. It is not a legal stroke if the ball is scooped. Massé shots take a great deal of practice, but offer variations from squirts to long curves that can put you way ahead of your competition. And the key to successful Massé shots is practice, learning to balance the elements of direction, forward motion, and spin. You know, everybody has off days, but don't worry about it if you lose a game or two. Just stick with the sound techniques and keep practicing. We haven't had time to tell you everything we know, but you can hang your head on what we have told you, and you'll learn a lot more just by playing the game. So good luck, and we'll see you out there on the tour. Hey, nice shot, Lori John. Thanks, but I couldn't do with any other cue stick. Here's an astonishing fact. More than 70% of the top American pros play with a Meucci original. Internationally, more than 90% of the top pros depend on Meucci designs. That's because the pros know what playing a Meucci can mean to their game. A Meucci original is the result of years of engineering, design, analysis, and testing by the pros on the tour. The superior Meucci shaft, joint, and tip designs mean that a Meucci offers less tip deflection than any other cue stick in the world. Less deflection means truer aim for all your shots. It means you can keep the tip on the ball longer for more spin, and that means greater ball control. More control, consistent playability, that's what you get with a Meucci. Meucci designs are crafted to stringent performance and appearance specifications by skilled artisans. Each is a work of art, and only the finest materials go into a Meucci design. Beauty, control, playability. If you're serious about your game, there's only one name, Meucci. Meucci Originals, the performance cues. 
It's amazing what a Meiuchi can do for your game. Get your hands on a Meiuchi, and you'll never let it go. To order any of the Meiuchi cues you've just seen, or for a free, no-obligation brochure, call now. 601-895-4877. Or write Meiuchi Originals, 7472 Old Highway 78, Olive Branch, Mississippi, 38654. Use your Visa or MasterCard and call right now to place your order. 601-895-4877.